Welcome to C-Suite Hot Seat, the show where we put C-level executives from language service providers of all sizes in the hot seat. We will ask tough questions and get inspired answers. Hello and welcome to the C-Suite Hot Seat, the show where we put C-level executives from the language industry in the hot seat. My name is Eddie Arrieta. I am the head of growth here at Multilingual Media. And I am Blasco Varga, and I'm a senior consultant and researcher at Nimsi Insights. And today, in our hot seat, we have Heather Shoemaker, founder and CEO of Language IO. Hello, Heather. Good to have you here. Hi. So nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you both. And let's just get started. Heather, in one sentence, uh, tell us, what does your company do? So we provide technology that allows monolingual customer support teams to provide e-support in any language um, within the CRM where the team works. What's the first career you dream of having as a kid? As a child, I was certain that I wanted to be a country music singer. Impressive. That is great. <laughs> that is great to hear. And when you're not working... Do you spend any time uh, playing music or what do you do to spend your free time? No, these days I just listen to music, I'm afraid. No singing here, not even karaoke. <laughs> that is great to know. Is there anything else you do to spend to spend your time uh, with your family or friends? Oh, yeah. We live in Wyoming, which is a very rural state in the U United States. Um, lots of mountains and hiking and rock climbing. I just like to be outside with my dog. And if you were uh, given an opportunity then to visit okay. three different countries, uh, which ones would you choose and why? Oh, okay. First I would go to Nigeria because I've never been there and I have some close friends there. And it just seems like a really exciting, fun, vibrant place to visit. I would go back to Scotland because I was recently there with my mom and we got to go to the Isle of Skye, but we didn't get to go island hopping through the, I forget, I'm going to say it wrong, the Outer Hebrides. It looks like really fun to spend more time there. And then I would spend more time in South America because I've spent lots of time in Latin America. I lived in Mexico for a long time, lots of time in the Caribbean, but I've never spent a lot of time um, in Colombia or Peru or any of the South American countries. And I do speak Spanish and I would love to go. Well, we'll be, we'll be waiting for you when you get here to South America. I will take you up um, on that. <laughs> great. Um, wh what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Um, life isn't fair and uh, deal with it. I couldn't that, agree is, with that is a really good, it's a good, <laughs> really, really straightforward and really uh, on point, uh, right, Laszlo? I think I think this is really good uh, to to get to know you, Heather, and I'm just gonna let Laszlo dig a little deeper now. Yeah, Heather, um, from country singing um, aspirations, how did you get to found your own company? There are a lot of changes between wanting to be a country music singer and founding my own company. Of course, I was probably all of six or seven when the country music singing was my um, goal. So yeah, I, in high school, I really started forming an interest in speaking other languages. I didn't grow up speaking another language, but um, I got pretty good at French in high school. And then I started in with Spanish. I do have um, relatives in Spain. And so they were enthusiastic about me speaking some Spanish. And so you know, I graduated from high school, went to college. I graduated with a linguistics degree in college, speaking French, Portuguese, and Spanish. And um, for a while after my undergraduate degree, I worked as an interpreter and doing language re related things as an independent contributor, but I didn't see that as my long term goal. But then I uh, was listening to a radio interview um, on NPR here in the United States. And at the time, the uh, an answer was saying that the future is software development. And if, if you want a good career, learn Java. And I started digging into it and thinking of software development and programming as really just another language. It's just a really powerful language, right? And I thought, well, maybe I will go down this path. So I went and got um, a graduate degree 
in engineering from CU Boulder in Colorado and was able to kind of combine my love for speaking and writing other languages, traditional languages with software development in the field of software internationalization. And I worked for about a decade as an internationalization field engineer, helping companies uh, internationalize their, their software so that their software could support many languages. And during that time, I, I started to realize that the biggest challenge that these companies were facing as they were going global wasn't what I was doing. What I was doing was necessary, but once you do it, you maintain it and it's pretty straightforward. The bigger challenge was the messier operational challenge of how do you provide support in all of the languages that your company needs to support. And they were just staffing up native speaking teams at the time, which wasn't scalable and was costing them a lot of money. And so at that time, I started thinking, how could I build a technology solution that solved this problem? And yeah, that's where I got the idea. I think you were speaking about client challenges that your company solves. What are your own business challenges um, in uh, at Language.io? Well, you know, one challenge that we face is this is a relatively new market. So it's not the traditional language services space that we're in. Certainly not. It's, yeah, it's it's deep technology, it's AI, it's you know, natural language processing. Um, and defining the market and the verticals that make sense to go after has been a challenge. You can't boil the ocean, so you can't go after everything all at once. And just really refining that go-to-market strategy and tackling the right market verticals has probably been the biggest challenge for us, but we're getting there. Well, you're now a successful CEO, um, but I'm sure there were a few failures along the path. Can you name a few of them? I would say I'm a technical founder, right? I, I'm a, an engineer and not. I didn't come into this with an MBA like a lot of my founders do on the business side of things. So when I founded the company, I, I wasn't as um, savvy about what it takes to grow and scale a startup on the business side of things. I just thought if I build really good technology, they will come. And so initially I thought it would be just fine to bootstrap language IO to grow organically because our technology is amazing. What I didn't realize was you need to go after funding. You need to really focus on the business and sales strategy. And so it took a few years in the early days to recognize that, yeah, you could grow organically and not go after VC funding, but what's going to happen is that others are recognizing that this was a really big market and we were going to just die a slow death if we couldn't grow as fast as these competitors coming into the market. So, you know, I probably waited a little longer than I should have to go after VC funding, but we did and have successfully raised quite a bit of money at this point. Sounds like a very big learning that you had uh, during your growth. So what is the secret sauce to your success then? Just don't don't give up. If you know you have a good product market fit, um, like I said, life isn't fair, right? And you just have to accept that some things come down to luck. But when you have a little stretch of bad luck, you know that it's going to turn around and just keep trying. And I know that sounds trite, but it is easy to give give up when things aren't, aren't going your way. But if you can be confident in what you've built and stick with it, you know, things, things will turn around. And that's kind of been why it's worked for us. Did you ever have moments when you're thinking, oh, no, we, we need to pivot away from here and do something else? Honestly, never. I've always known that the technology that we've built is the future. I've never questioned that. Um, you know, while a lot of folks were building up these networks of, of human linguists because they thought that was the future, we've stuck with our machine translation technology and AI, our proprietary AI that we've built in that space because we're, nobody's going backwards. Everybody's moving ahead with a full machine solution at this point. And it's worked. It's It's proven to be true. To you personally, what does success mean? There are kind of two different versions of success. There's the day by day, right? Of course, every entrepreneur like myself wants to have some glorious exit where you, you know, sell your company and wind up on the beach and all is well. But I'm a firm believer that it's about the journey and that if all you do is just 
wait for that moment when you think you've achieved success, then you're missing out on the daily achievements and the little things every day that make you happy. And if what you're doing doesn't make you happy day in and day out, then you shouldn't be doing it. So for me, success is day by day. Like I really enjoy language IO and growing the company and the team that we've built. So success for me is just being happy right now in this day. Of course, you know, we've got this end goal and we're all working towards it because we all want to to see success, you know, in the end as well. But it's really a day by day thing. Very well. Then uh, how big is your team that you have built for your success? The company is about 60 people today. Wow. We're we're actively hiring um, to, you know, especially on the machine learning and AI side of the house, because we've got some big plans for generative AI, like everybody does. But we we really have some exciting things that we're building on that front. And then um, also, of course, to scale the company and grow, you need to continue to hire in all areas um, that people don't always think about, like product managers and, of course, sales folks and solutions architects and all of the pieces. You can't be too heavy on one side and not balance things out throughout the organization. How do you keep your team motivated, um, especially in times when, you know, generative AI, large language models, they seem to be able to do almost anything and everything. Your product stands out, your company stands out. Um, how do you keep your team motivated to keep standing out? Well, generative AI is exciting for us. We don't see it as a hindrance whatsoever. I mean, there were this it was the same talk about neural machine translation five, seven years ago, where everybody in the language space was, oh no, it's taking over. There's no need for us anymore. Um, but just like Google Translate is not the be all end all without the missing context, neither is generative AI. It's the same exact problem that we're solving. We provide the, the context. It's just that generative AI sounds better, sounds more human-like, right? So the layer that we've built and the models that we've built to intelligently select the best neural machine translation engine for that language pair in that moment, for the type of content for the company that's making the request, all of that applies to generative AI as well. We're providing the same context to generative AI that we provided to neural machine translation platforms. So our team knows this. Um, they've got their battle cards. They're ready to to go full full steam ahead in this new world. Uh, job well done, I guess, so far. Um, yeah. Quick question about your team, um, especially your senior staff. Yeah. Kind of tricky question. Would you enthusiastically rehire them? Oh, heck yes. I have an amazing team. Oh, that's a very short and very to the point answer. There is no doubt whatsoever in your voice. Okay. All right. Um, then um, probably one of my last questions is, uh, yourself, you are a leader. What makes you a good leader and how do you keep yourself being, being a good leader? I don't assume that I'm always right about things. And I've hired people who know more than I do in their area, who are smarter and do their jobs. I hire people who don't need a lot of hand-holding um, and I trust them. And so I do need to provide direction for the company and I'm comfortable with that, you know, staying on top of new trends and technology such as generative AI. And, you know, there's, and they're going to be coming faster and faster in my opinion. But as a leader, I think maintaining trust in my team, a positive outlook, being confident in what we're building, those, those are the important things, but listening listening to the team and taking their advice and and hearing their concerns. I, I don't think you can be a dictator. Um, it's important to lean on your team, right? Like if it weren't for my team, I'd be so stressed out all the time, but I have an amazing team that I can lean on and I, I do lean on them. What kind of advice would you have given yourself when you were starting your company? Or alternatively, what would be your advice now in this new era to fresh language technology entrepreneurs? You always look back and think about the things that you could have done differently, but had you done them differently, you wouldn't have learned everything that you learned along the way. But, you know, it if we had gone after a fundraise earlier, we could have scaled faster earlier. As soon as we realized how big the market opportunity was, that should have been the moment instead of just assuming that nobody else would notice and they did. But yeah, I think I'm happy with where where we are and where we're headed. 
but yeah, that's probably what I would have done a little bit earlier. Um, as far as other entrepreneurs in this space, I would say pay attention to technology trends and make sure that you are building something that it, that can adapt because technology is going to be changing faster and faster. New things are going to be popping up that you weren't expecting. So just make sure that your platform that you're building is flexible enough to pivot and that the, the problem that you are solving um, is a real problem that that big company that you that you've researched and validated, right? So validate the problem that you think you need to solve. Do as much market research as you can and as much technology research as you can to ensure that what you're building is is going to answer questions and solve that problem. Heather, thank you so much for these insights. And I think I will be had, um, handing it back to Eddie for some rapid fire questions. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Laszlo. And thank you, Heather. This is this is very insightful. Uh, and thank you for your time again. Um, so a few rapid fire questions. Bear with me uh, and give me your most honest answers. Number one, which music would you choose to help you focus, relax, work, I guess? I don't know if you've heard of Brian Eno. That's the kind of thing I can have in the background, ambient music. Give me one country outside of the country you're currently living in that okay. you would choose to live in. Mexico. Great. Uh, so that's going to help you uh, with the next uh, question. So outside of your native language, uh, give me your favorite word. Pantalones. <laughs> <laughs> that is great. Pantalones. Um, could you tell us one uh, of the last business books you've read? Yeah, The Culture Map. A friend of mine recommended it. And because we're a virtual company, we have people all over the world. It's really important to understand how different cultures interact. So the culture map has been invaluable. Thank you. And what time of the day do you get your best work done? Around 10 a.m. I've read my emails. Um, if I can find a little stretch of no meetings around 10 a.m., I can really kick butt. Thank you. And I just came up with this one, Laszlo. What's your favorite drink? Oh, geez. My favorite drink. Chai tea. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Heather, for joining us in the hot seat. I hope you have enjoyed your time with us. If anyone feels like letting off some steam and being part of the C-suite at uh, and it's in a language services industry company, please sign up with us and we'll be happy to have you with us. Yes, and thank you again, Heather. As for the viewers, that was all, folks. Thank you for watching and look out for our next episode that will be published also as a video on Multilingual TV, as well as a podcast on the Nimsy website. Thanks again.